In the face of intensifying pressure to accept a ceasefire deal with Hamas, Israel's prime minister remains defiant. I would define the end of the war in Gaza. In Gaza. When, when Hamas no longer rules Gaza. Plus, one of the deadliest Russian attacks on Ukraine of the war so far. The Russian scum will undoubtedly be held accountable for this. And later, Russian President Vladimir Putin in Mongolia, MPOX in the DRC, and climate change is threatening a traditional and delicious Korean dish. Today is Tuesday, September 3rd, and this is VOA's Flashpoint. Good evening, I'm Lori London, along with Steve Karish. <laughs> Thousands of demonstrators gathered outside Benjamin Netanyahu's private home in central Jerusalem on Monday night, calling on the Israeli leader to reach a ceasefire deal with Hamas to bring the remaining hostages home. In his first public remarks since Sunday's mass protests following the discovery of six more dead hostages, Netanyahu on Monday pushed back against growing pressure within his country and internationally to reach a deal. I would define the end of the war in Gaza. In Gaza. When, when Hamas no longer rules Gaza. Netanyahu said he will continue to insist on a demand that has emerged as a major sticking point in talks, Israeli control of the Philadelphia Corridor a narrow band along Gaza's border with Egypt where Israel contends Hamas smuggles weapons into Gaza. And massive protests in Israel show the mix of emotions, of anger and grief that Israelis are feeling. Grief at seeing six of their country men and women's dead bodies return home from Gaza, and anger at the thought that it could have been prevented. For more on this, I'm joined by Linda Gradstein in Jerusalem. Well, I think the mood is a combination of sadness and anger. Uh, the sadness is because there was a they were killed apparently just 48 hours or so before the Israeli soldiers got to them. And anger because there's a sense uh, that they could have been rescued alive if Israel had agreed to a ceasefire deal. And the anger is coming really at the prime minister, at Benjamin Netanyahu. And on Sunday night, for example, there were 500,000 people in the streets. And it happened last night again, and there are more demonstrations. And it's sort of a reminder of what the demonstrations were like when Netanyahu was trying to push through this uh, judicial overhaul that a lot of people thought was uh, anti-democratic. Since the war began in Gaza, you haven't seen that because people have felt that while there's a war on, there's not. it's not the right time to be going out and demonstrating. But somehow the, the deaths of these six people have touched a nerve and have kind of brought people out to the streets again. When Biden said that Netanyahu wasn't doing enough, he, Netanyahu, uh, Biden didn't also call out Sinwar. And the demonstrations in Israel against Netanyahu, they, they don't seem to be as angry at Hamas. They, they, they're blaming their own government. No, well, I think people are angry at Hamas. And, and you know, there is a sense, you know, that first of all, the Israeli left has been uh, pretty dormant for a long time. And I think that this attack in Gaza by Hamas has kind of really put, uh, you know, an end to whatever left there was in Israel. And it's not that they don't blame Hamas and it's not that they're not angry at Hamas in Israel, because of course they are. But I think they feel like the only people that they can really uh, have an effect on is their own government, that they can't have an effect on Hamas. So what's next? There are ceasefire negotiations underway. Biden said he's going to present a, a take it or leave it uh, deal to Hamas and to Israel. H how do you see this playing out over the next couple of days? Well, I'm not sure the next couple of days. I think it might take a little bit longer. And and I think that if, you know, what what I've been reading, at least in the Israeli press, is they are concerned that this proposal from Biden and Qatar and Egypt 
uh, will uh, ask, you know, Israel to do things that it's not willing to do. For example, Netanyahu said again in a news conference last night that Israel will not leave the Philadelphia corridor, which is the border between Gaza and Egypt, and that that's the only way to prevent smuggling. So I think that if Israel and Hamas are presented with a take it or leave it proposal, uh, it's going to be very hard for Israel to say no. So um, I think Israel is going to be in a dilemma, to be quite honest. And I think that what Hamas wants is they'll hold off and they'll wait for Israel, hopefully, you know, from their perspective to say no, and then they can say yes and, and look good. If Israel says yes, that puts Hamas in a dilemma. Um, and I think that there's a sense in at least Netanyahu's thinking that uh, at this point it would be a mistake to stop the war without having achieved all of Israel's goals. Fia Ways, Linda Gradstein in Jerusalem. Linda, thanks again for your time. Thanks for your reporting. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Greece and Ukraine as well, after one of the deadliest Russian strikes on Ukrainian territory of the war so far. At least 41 people were killed and nearly 200 injured. President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke on Tuesday. I've received preliminary reports on the Russian strike on Poltava. According to currently available information, two ballistic missiles hit the territory of an educational institution and a nearby hospital. One of the buildings of the Institute of Communications was partially destroyed. People found themselves under the rubble. Many were saved. More than 180 people were injured. Unfortunately, many died. As of this time, 41 people are known to have died. Zelensky used this as another example of why he's been pressuring Western allies for more longer-range weapons. He also used this as an opportunity to express his anger. The Russian scum will undoubtedly be held accountable for this. And once again, we urge everyone in the world who has the power to stop this terror. Air defense systems and missiles are needed in Ukraine, not in a warehouse somewhere. Long-range strikes that can defend against Russian terror are needed now, not sometime later. Every day of delay, unfortunately, means more lives lost. He added that he had ordered a full and prompt investigation into the circumstances of the attack. And with Ukraine under attack, Russian President Vladimir Putin is getting a red carpet welcome in a visit to Mongolia. Normally, a state visit like this wouldn't raise eyebrows around the world, but these aren't normal times. Putin is under indictment from the International Criminal Court for war crimes related to his invasion of Ukraine, and Mongolia is a signatory of the ICC Treaty, meaning they are under a legal obligation to arrest him. For a look at the law, Laurie spoke with Thomas Graham. He's a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a co-founder of Yale University's Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program. Starting with the question of Putin's motive, was it simply a show of defiance? There are a lot of things that figure into Putin's calculations. Uh, you know, among them is the fact that he's making a point that uh, he He's not being isolated, that he can travel. This was a good choice for him because uh, Mongolia is stuck between Russia and China uh, and needs to maintain good relations but with Russia. There are some investment plans, uh, energy transit plans that involve Mongolia. Uh, so I think, you know, Putin's calculation was that uh, this would be a place you go to a country that is a a party to the ICC and reach an agreement that he wouldn't be arrested. So it is defiance uh, on the part of Putin. Uh, and I think that's an important part of his, uh, his calculation. Do you think it also, though, could potentially bring to light the fact that he does have very few places he's able to travel to? Well, you know, this isn't the first time he's traveled abroad. He's traveled a few other places. You know, he's very careful about these things and testing the waters. Uh, and I'm sure that they will ask elsewhere uh, whether this is possible for him to travel without his risking arrest. Uh, so this is a start. I'm sure they, he sees this as a positive step. Uh, where they take it is, um, is anyone's guess at this point. I was reading that it, it's his first trip to a member nation of the International Criminal Court since I warrant. Does that make a difference for Mongolia to basically not fulfill its legal obligations, given that it is a party to the ICC? Well, look, I mean, Mongolia is aware of that. Uh, it made a calculation uh, and decided it was better to have 
uh, good working relations with the Russians, and it was to honor an ICC order for uh, for his arrest. Um, so, uh, you know, will there be some reaction from the ICC? Almost certainly. What can they do to Mongolia? Uh, that's another question. But in any event, I'm sure in Ulan Bator, uh, they've gone through the uh, the risk and benefits and decided uh, inviting Putin to Mongolia brought more benefit than, than the risk that they would run from the ICC in any other country. Can the ICC ultimately, it doesn't have the ability to actually execute warrants. Is there any repercussions that Mongolia could face? Uh, almost uh, none that would be of any significance. And, and you're absolutely right. The ICC depends on parties to the convention to execute its uh, uh, its orders. And you know, Mongolia simply decided that it wasn't going to do it under the circumstances. Do you think most countries that are party to this in general, most would actually be more risky <laughs> for Putin? Yeah. Look, I mean, there was a, a summit meeting in, in uh, South Africa last year. I forget which um, which group it was. Um, and the South Africans are big supporters of the ICC. And they worked out an arrangement so that he would, Putin wouldn't participate uh, in person uh, at that meeting. They did it to, through a video link. Uh, so it varies from country to country. It's how strongly a country feels about the ICC. Uh, certainly Moscow is aware of this. Uh, and Putin is not going to take make a visit without all these things being worked out in advance. Um, so that by they reduced to a minimum any risk that he would be detained in the country that he visited. VOA's Laurie London speaking with Thomas Graham, a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. You're listening to Flashpoint from the Voice of America. I'm Steve Karish with Laurie London in Washington. Climate change threatens one of South Korea's staple foods. We'll learn more in a few moments. Now in Africa, dozens of MPOX patients are crammed into large plastic isolation tents in the East Democratic Republic of Congo. Medicine shortages and overwhelmed hospital workers are making it hard to control what is now a global public health emergency. Sean Hogan with Reuters has more. Lying on thin mattresses on damp earth, this is an overcrowded makeshift MPOX isolation ward in East Democratic Republic of Congo. The country is the epicentre of the global public health emergency declared by the World Health Organisation last month. Overstretched hospital workers grapple with drug shortages and lack of space to accommodate the influx of patients. In Kavumu, 900 symptomatic patients, like Sifa Mwakasisi, have been taken in over the past three months. They should give us medicine and put us in good conditions, instead of just locking us in these cages if we're not human, telling us no one should come near us. The head of the Congo's MPOX response team acknowledged that parts of the vast country lacked medicine. He added that dispatching donations, including 115 tonnes of medicine from the World Bank, was a priority. Relatives, who usually provide the bulk of meals in underfunded public facilities, were banned from visiting the MPOX ward to avoid contamination. Basic treatment is also a challenge. Here's Kavumu Hospital's medical director, Musole Mulamba Muva. We have many challenges. The first challenge concerns the supply of medicine, because we run out of medicine every day, because the stocks given to us by partners often run out without being able to renew. We have to wait for more medicine to arrive, and so we always experience shortages, medicine shortages. And that's a big challenge we have in managing this disease. Vaccines are set to arrive within days to fight the new strain of the virus, while Congo's president has allowed a first $10 million disimbursement to fight the outbreak. Over 19,000 suspected cases of MPOX have been reported since the start of the year in Congo, according to the health ministry. Of those, 5,000 were confirmed and 655 were fatal. That was Sean Hogan with Reuters. Also in the DRC, authorities brutally squashed an attempted jailbreak. At least 129 people were killed during the melee in the country's main prison in Kinshasa. Shabani Luku is the DRC's interior minister. 
The provisional human toll stands at 129 dead, including 24 by gunshot after being given a warning. The others died by jostling, suffocation, and some women were raped. The Commission has also identified 59 injured, currently being cared for by the government, for appropriate medical care. Earlier, a prison official had said that no prisoners had succeeded in escaping, adding that those who tried to escape had been killed. The government had said the situation is now under control and that it's investigating. Controversy lingers in Venezuela as the attorney general's office said that a court has issued an arrest warrant for an opposition leader. Edmundo Gonzalez is accused of conspiracy and other crimes amid a dispute over whether he or President Nicolas Maduro won the July election. Gabe Singer with Reuters has the story. A Venezuelan court has issued an arrest warrant for opposition leader Edmundo Gonzalez amid a dispute over whether he or President Nicolas Maduro won the country's presidential election in late July. News of the warrant came from the country's attorney general's office on Monday, which shared a photo of the document with Reuters. The warrant accuses Gonzalez of conspiracy and other crimes. Maduro spoke on state television after news of the warrant broke, calling Gonzalez a, quote, cowardly man. An arrest warrant against Gonzalez would amount to a major escalation in Maduro's government's crackdown against the opposition following the disputed July 28th election which has included detentions of opposition figures and protesters. Venezuela's National Electoral Authority and its top court have said Maduro won with just over half of the votes. But tallies shared by the opposition show a resounding victory for Gonzalez. The opposition, along with some Western countries and international bodies like a United Nations panel of experts, have said the vote was not transparent and demanded publication of full tallies, with some outright decrying fraud. A Gonzalez spokesperson said they were awaiting any notification of a warrant, but made no further comment. The opposition has denied any wrongdoing. The warrant request came hours after the Biden administration said an aircraft used by Maduro had been confiscated in the Dominican Republic. Washington determined that its purchase violated U.S. sanctions, while the Venezuelan government slammed the move as an act of piracy. That was Gabe Singer with Reuters. And ahead of the upcoming U.S. presidential election in November, the two major political parties are expressing concern about election integrity, meaning the process of registration, the casting of, counting and certifying of votes, as well as adequately addressing any serious issues that arise. More from VOA's chief national correspondent Steve Herman on Capitol Hill. Democrats accuse Republicans of limiting access to polling stations and plotting to hamper the certification of the results. Republicans suspect Democratic Party operatives of tampering with absentee ballots, manipulating voting machines, and keeping ineligible voters on the rolls. The Republican nominee, former President Donald Trump, is facing criminal charges over his attempts to overturn his 2020 election loss. I thought the election was a rigged election, a stolen election. The Democratic Party's nominee, Vice President Kamala Harris, accuses Trump of undermining confidence in elections while she pledges to uphold fundamental American principles. From the rule of law to free and fair elections, to the peaceful transfer of power. Federal agencies have been conducting tabletop exercises mindful of January 6, 2021, when Trump supporters, unhappy with the president's defeat, stormed the U.S. Capitol. Has the preparation strengthened election integrity? That is the hope of stakeholders such as the 104-year-old League of Women Voters, whose chief executive officer is Selena Stewart. But I guess it's a wait and see. <laughs> we'll have to see what happens, what the outcome of the election is, how people feel about it, what, what protests, and whether that protest crosses the line into violence. And my hope is that it doesn't. So far this year, the system has held up well, according to the chairman of the Federal Election Assistance Commission, Ben Hovland. We've had a lot of primaries already, both the presidential primaries this year, but state primaries. Uh, And so election officials have had a lot of practice already this season. uh, And I think we're in good shape going into November. In Champaign County in the state of Illinois, the local Republican Party in 2020 tried to have a judge compel the county clerk, Aaron Ammons, to stop counting mailed-in ballots. 
and he dismissed that that claim and uh, I was able to count the ballots. But they definitely tried it. Uh, just like they were trying in other places across the country. Threats, intimidation and lawsuits have prompted many election officials and volunteers nationwide to quit, according to Ammons. It does a disservice and it really is disheartening to the people who do this work if we're not getting the support that uh, that we obviously need for being on the front lines of democracy. It is important to invite candidates, party officials and the public to watch the system in operation. According to the director of elections in St. Louis County, Missouri, Eric Fay. Opening mail ballots, tabulating ballots, testing voting equipment, manually recounting, you know, auditing after the election. All of these things are publicly observable. Senate Republican leadership wants to pass legislation that would require people registering to vote to provide proof of citizenship. Most Democrats here on Capitol Hill argue that the law already makes it illegal for non-citizens to vote in federal elections. And there's no evidence to support claims that illegal immigrants in significant numbers are voting. Steve Herman, VOA News, on Capitol Hill. And finally today, South Korea's famous Kim Chi is falling victim to climate change, with scientists, farmers, and manufacturers saying the quality and quantity of the Napa cabbage that is pickled to make the ubiquitous dish is suffering due to rising temperatures. Saya Kirjasny with Reuters has the story. The spicy, tangy dish called kimchi, a foundation of Korean food culture, is succumbing to climate change in its homeland. South Korean scientists, farmers and manufacturers say they see a decline in the quality and quantity of its main ingredient, the Napa cabbage. Kim Seagup has grown kimchi cabbage for more than half a century and has seen dramatic changes that he blames at least in part on climate change. I can feel that a climate crisis is approaching. There are many signs, but to give a representative example, take Maibong San Mountain in Taibaek County, which can be considered the origin of highland cabbage in our country. However, the cultivation area there has fallen by half because of soil diseases and viruses that thrive in high temperatures. Napa cabbage thrives in cool climates ideally between 64 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But in Gangwon province, where nearly all of it is grown in the country, summer temperatures are now closer to an average of 77 degrees, with peaks of 86. Government data shows high temperatures and erratic weather have eaten away at Napa cabbage farming areas by more than half since the 2000s. And the Rural Development Administration's climate change scenarios project this area will shrink to only around 100 acres in 25 years, with none in the highlands by 2090. Researchers are taking action to push back on the impact by developing heat and disease-resistant varieties of Napa cabbage. Plant pathologist Lee young is at the National Institute of Crop Science. We are also looking into watering methods that could help lower temperatures and, as I mentioned earlier, expanding the use of biological control methods to combat the newly emerging half-wilt disease. Additionally, since highland areas are typically sloped, we are researching cultivation techniques that allow for stable farming on slopes. Given the rising temperatures, we are also working on developing cabbage varieties that can grow well, even in higher temperatures. It all adds to the challenges for South Korea's homegrown kimchi industry, which also faces competition from lower-priced imports from China, mostly used in restaurants. The kimchi that South Korea brings in from overseas rose from January to July this year, hitting some $98 million, up around 7% from last year, and surpassing the 2022 record. That was Sayakir Jasni with Reuters. And that's going to wrap up today's program. There's more VOA coverage 24 hours a day on our website, voanews.com, and across our social media platforms. On behalf of Lori London and everyone here at VOA, thanks for listening. Until tomorrow, I'm Steve Karish. For deeper dives and expert analysis, listen to VOA Podcasts. Issues in the News explores the biggest stories every weekend, while International Edition keeps you informed every weekday. 
Plus, with the five-minute newscast at the top of every hour, you're always up to date.